Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome back to uh, day number two of this uh, Baltic Sea Security Seminar. Uh, I would like to start off by thanking everyone for uh, contributing so much to the conversation yesterday. I think we had a, a great uh, discussion going, and uh, I hope we will uh, finish up uh, in the same spirit here today. So please, uh, you know, continue to feel free, comment, uh, reflect, and, uh, and join, the, join the conversation. And also the setting last evening, uh, my personal reflection, both uh, getting a bit of the history of Visby and also with that the history of the Baltic Sea region, uh, our um, bloody relations with not least uh, Denmark, but also that it uh, gives some hope for, for the future that you can uh, work, work your way through relations and improve them and, and uh, get, get to a much better place. So um, we're happy about that as well. Um, <coughs> On the discussion yesterday, a very, very brief uh, sum up just to say where we are, I think, on the strategic playing field. Uh, we agree that we have a, a common awareness of the importance of that, but at the same time, we need to work on a common strategy. On cooperation, we find that it's frozen in one end towards Russia, but it's intensified in, in the other end among uh, other countries. Uh, and at the same time, we need to find new forms and new formats also for, for that cooperation. On the Western side, not least the EU-NATO dimension was mentioned, uh, but also uh, how to get some kind of dialogue with the Russian and under which uh, circumstances. On the strategic partners, I think that was an important point, that the regional actors, we really need also to involve our strategic partners outside of the region for the security of this region. And my fourth point comes on joint uh, threat assessment that we all discussed and we will be hearing a, a summing up from the group <coughs> discussions. I heard there were uh, good discussions, but uh, that we need joint threat assessments also together and uh, that we need to include uh, the hybrid threat in, in that kind of assessments. And uh, hybrid warfare, as we learned, it's not new, perhaps, but the scale and the speed and the active orchestration of what's going on is new. And it creates ambiguity and atmosphere of unpredictability and deception. And uh, that we need to deal with. We will talk about this in this session, I think, on the military environment and what, what to do, how to act in such, uh, with such uh, conditions. Uh, but it also undermines the decision-making process, and that's very important for us, both the political decision-making process and how the military uh, de decision-making process is also part of that in the democracies that we, we are part of. So new standards, procedures, tools, and exercises also involves the hybrid threat, you can say, and, and the link to not least the EU, but perhaps also the OSCE. So that will lead us into today's uh, uh, <coughs> discussion and uh, what we have here uh, in front of us is uh, the new challenges in the military environment. And uh, we have a new pattern, as we all are aware, of increased military activity in the Baltic Sea region uh, and also an increased risk of incidents and confrontation. We already have experienced that in various ways. So uh, we will hear more and learn more on the challenges, but also the patterns of the exercises and activities uh, so that we can see what can we expect ahead uh, and how can we pl uh, plan, what are the implications for this and uh, do we need uh, new guidelines, new ways of, of cooperation ahead. So I'm very happy to have with us uh, the third very distinguished panel of, of this, uh, this seminar. And uh, we will start with Mr. Lukas Kulesa, who is the research director at the European Leadership Network and has uh, former worked at the Polish Institute of International Affairs and the National Security Bureau in Warsaw. His area of research includes non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and Russia's security policy. And uh, Mr. Kulesa is also co-author of a report that created a stir, I would say, in November last year, uh, dangerous brinkmanship on close military encounters between Russia and NATO in 2014. 
So, uh, Lukas, you have worked extensively on, on logging all these incidents and all, all, I think on, on the open sources almost one weekly the past year in the, in the Baltic Sea region. Uh, so, what, what's going on? Are we back to the Cold War here? And, and will this, what will this increased level of uh, assertive behavior lead to? Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, let, me, let me start by thanking you uh, and then thanking uh, all the organizers for the, the invitation and the uh, possibility uh, to take part uh, in the fascinating discussions yesterday and I hope uh, also uh, today. Uh, I find it a bit perverse that actually in a panel which deals with military issues uh, you have two civilians uh, from Poland as far as I, I know. Uh, Anya doesn't have a military rank. Uh, I got my drafting book in good old, old days but wasn't drafted so probably uh, my category in the military is a, a prisoner of war. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll, try, I'll try my best to talk uh, primarily about uh, the, the report that you so uh, kindly mentioned, uh, but then uh, hopefully also uh, about a, a bit uh, broader issues. Uh, so uh, the report, as it was mentioned, was published uh, last uh, November, uh, and uh, we use open sources only, uh, and we uh, basically uh, put together the information about the count encounters uh, between aircraft, between Navy ships, uh, or evolving uh, civil aviation, uh, reports about violations of space, airspace, uh, interdiction of civilians' aircraft, uh, and strategic bombers, but also uh, mysterious uh, uh, underwater object uh, hunts, uh, other incidents uh, which added to the uh, atmosphere of uh, high tensions between the, the West and uh, Russia. Uh, we covered uh, the, uh, the time frame uh, starting from March 2014, uh, we are all aware of the incidents that took place uh, before uh, they weren't put in the, the report, including the, the Good Friday uh, incidents, uh, incident uh, involving uh, Sweden, uh, Russia and Denmark. Uh, in March this year, uh, we updated the report uh, using also the, the, statement, the statements and ad fact sheets which were provided by NATO, uh, but also provided uh, increasingly often uh, by uh, Russia. Uh, the total number of the incidents which were logged by the uh, ELN uh, between March 2014 and March 2015 uh, stand as three high-risk incidents, 13 serious incidents, uh, 15 year routine incidents. I'll explain it in a moment, uh, but that's uh, to, 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 to leave the math out of uh, our uh, talk, that brings uh, an overall total to 66 specific incidents uh, which uh, we identified from uh, public sources. And out, out of this, more than half, 40 incidents. Uh, including three high-risk and eight serious incidents, uh, took place in the Baltic Sea uh, area. Um, now, the high-risk incidents uh, are those which, in our view, uh, and based on the on the public uh, publicly available sources, uh, carried a high probability of causing casualties or causing a direct military uh, confrontation. And this included uh, a, a narrowly avoided collision between uh, a civilian airliner and a Russian civilian's plane in March 2014. Uh, second, the abduction of the uh, Estonian intelligence officer in September 2014, uh, and uh, a large uh, scale uh, hunt uh, in Sweden uh, for uh, an under, underwater object in October. Uh, 2014. Uh, serious incidents are those which, in our opinion, are of a more aggressive or unusually provocative uh, nature and thus carried uh, a higher than usual risk of escalation. Uh, this included uh, harassment of uh, civilian plane, planes, uh, overflight or close maneuvers uh, over NATO ships, um, mock bombing right missions against Sweden, Denmark, uh, Canada or the US. Uh, but also the detention of a Lithuanian vessel uh, in the uh, Barents Sea. Uh, near routine incidents uh, included uh, scrambles of, of NATO and partner uh, fighters to intercept Russian uh, aircraft. Uh, I mentioned 66, but the overall numbers are, of course, uh, much higher. 
uh, NATO reported that it conducted over 400 intercepts uh, of Russian aircraft in 2014, uh, which is four times higher than in 2013. Um, Russia claims that it counted twice as many flights of NATO uh, tactical aircraft near its border uh, in, uh, to, uh, in 2014 as, uh, as, uh, uh, as compared with uh, 2013. Uh, since March, when we did uh, the, the, the last update, uh, there are at least two incidents that were uh, made public uh, which we think would qualify at least as serious. Uh, we've got uh, the April uh, 7 interception of a, a, a U.S. Air Force uh, plane uh, by uh, Russian Su-2027 uh, over, uh, over the Baltic Sea and understand that the U.S. filed a, a complaint uh, about the unprofessional behavior uh, of the Russian uh, pilot, which was publicly refuted by the Russian MOD. Uh, I, I, I don't have information whether there was a, a, an official uh, response on the, NATO, on the Russian side. Uh, and secondly, uh, there was the April 27th, 28th uh, underwater activity uh, in uh, Finnish uh, territorial uh, water. Uh, we also heard about harassments of the vessels which were uh, which are laying uh, an underwater uh, cable uh, in the in the Baltic Sea. Uh, unsurprisingly, the research confirms uh, that uh, it is Russia that is primarily engaging in uh, this brinkmanship uh, acts uh, with a number of reasons that we uh, put for, or I would put for the discussion here. Uh, there is the military dimension. Uh, which is about testing and training uh, Russia's own uh, armed forces, also gathering intelligence uh, on the responses uh, of NATO, Sweden, and Finland. Uh, there are political external uh, reasons having to do with sending a deterrence message and a message of resolve uh, towards uh, Russia's potential opponents, uh, and also trying to divide and or uh, scare uh, the, the countries, including countries in the Baltic Sea uh, region. Uh, there, seems also, there seems to also be political internal uh, reason having to do with mobilization of the public uh, opinion, uh, this message to the Russians that we won't be scared, uh, we, we, won't be, uh, we won't be intimidated uh, by the uh, might of the NATO alliance or the US, and actually that we have the measures uh, to, to fight back if, if necessary. It is not a coincidence that in, in Russian media you had many reports that the Russians managed uh, to sneak into the Kaliningrad exclave and uh, bring in um, uh, Iskander uh, systems without being detected, or that the Russians managed to overfly uh, U.S. or Canadian or Turkish uh, warship, and if necessary, they are able to uh, to, 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 to deal with the uh, Aegis system. As I mentioned, these are materials from the or, or these are news news from the from the Russian uh, sides, but they also uh, they are they're also uh, important and relevant uh, in this brinkmanship uh, game. Uh, now, uh, some are claiming that uh, all what is happening. Uh, the situation is tense, but the situation is fully manageable and constitutes merely a, a return to the familiar patterns known from the uh, Cold War. Uh, in our opinion, the, the uh, threat of uh, an accidental escalation is not uh, negligible, uh, and especially on the Russian side, uh, there seems to be highly motivated uh, elements uh, who are inclined to act much more uh, assertively uh, than before, either based on explicit orders received uh, or acting uh, based on their own assessment that the leadership, the Viechushka, uh, expects them uh, to display a more assertive, a more aggressive uh, attitude. So the main concern is uh, uh, the scenario in which, in which one of these incidents gets out of uh, control. Uh, our original report uh, recommended uh, the following three things. The first one, uh, that the Russian leadership should re-evaluate the costs and the risks uh, of continuing uh, with a, a more assertive uh, military posture. Uh, such review 
apparently has not taken place, uh, but Russia uh, has made some efforts to explain and justify its actions and to respond to its critic. Uh, we've seen a number of statements at the Russian official websites. We've seen uh, fact sheets, including those produced by the uh, Russian uh, delegation uh, to uh, NATO. Uh, Russia also provided some information uh, on uh, its exercise activities and long-range uh, aviation uh, flights. And discussion, uh, at least our discussion with some civilian Russian experts indicate that they understand the risks of continuing the current posture. Uh, so the first uh, recommendation was to, to Russia. Uh, the second recommendation was to all sides to improve military to military communication. And uh, it's now quite clear that there is a, 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 an understanding on the NATO side uh, that uh, military to military channels of communication uh, needs to be uh, kept open uh, despite uh, suspension of wider military to military uh, cooperation. So NATO confirmed uh, that the communication uh, links with the, the Russian general staff are open and are available 24-7. Uh, uh, and the avoidance of uh, dangerous incidents uh, has been discussed in depth um, in NATO, uh, but also, as I understand, but also uh, in the meetings uh, between Secretary General uh, and the Russian Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs. Questions, however, remain uh, whether the existing communication channels would be sufficient uh, during uh, an actual uh, crisis. Um, issues for the discussion, uh, would, does Sweden and Finland have similar direct lines of communication with uh, re relevant uh, parts of the Russian military establishment? Uh, is it worth considering opening a, a direct channel uh, to the Russian uh, Baltic Sea uh, fleet? Uh, the third recommendation was that all sides uh, should exercise military and political uh, restraint uh, and uh, especially review the rules of engagement uh, in uh, military encounters. And again, uh, it seems that on the NATO side, such a review has uh, taken uh, place, um, including the issues of the uh, visibility of, of NATO flights in a congested uh, airspace. Uh, it's, I, I don't have indications that similar review has taken place on the, on the Russian uh, side. Um, but certainly this is something which is, uh, uh, which is communicated to them uh, almost on a daily basis, the, the threat that their activities pose to the uh, civilian uh, aviations. Uh, now uh, on exercises, I won't spend too much time on it since I, I know that my colleagues uh, would tackle uh, this issue in more detail. Uh, but uh, let, me just, let me just give you two remarks. Uh, it seems that from the strategic communication and the battle, battle of the images perspective, uh, Russia's exercises uh, have been bigger and more impressive. Uh, I'm not judging here if they are more effective uh, to increase the, the, the military preparedness, but there seems to be more impressive when it comes to the, to the numbers. Uh, so there might be a need, and it might be worth uh, discussing a need uh, for either an annual or uh, biannual uh, large-scale uh, high visibility net NATO exercise uh, with an Article 5 uh, related scenario uh, and a clear deterrence and assurance agenda. We've heard about the next high visibility uh, exercise which is planned for 2018. Um, maybe it's sufficient from the military viewpoint uh, as a civilian, I would say there's quite a lot of things that might happen between now and 2018, uh, and uh, certainly uh, some elements of our publics and, and some elements of, the, of our media uh, would expect that actually uh, NATO does something uh, which is high visibility and is, which is large scale uh, before 2018. Uh, the second remark, uh, as it was already mentioned, uh, the need for uh, NATO-EU uh, cooperation. Uh, I would dare to get to, 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 to be 
bold and say that there, we should also think about the practi practicalities in terms of uh, involving the EU structures uh, in exercising uh, hybrid warfare uh, defense scenarios. Uh, there seems to be some elements like involvement of the border guards, uh, gendarmerie forces, police units, uh, where practical cooperation between NATO, EU, and obviously the national governments uh, would strengthen uh, our resilience. I know there is a long list of the political problems and obstacles, but if we are serious and we should not just compare notes uh, or exchange information, by all, but also uh, exercise uh, together. And the final, final point. Um, yesterday we had a discussion about uh, talking to Russia, uh, engaging uh, Russia, uh, and I'm, I'm definitely uh, not a fan of talking just for the sake uh, of talking or seeing, seeing uh, engagement with Russia as something which has value uh, on its own. There should be specific things, specific issues that we want from Russia, that we want to get out of this dialogue, and we, do, we need to specify this before uh, we make uh, any proposal or any movement uh, in this uh, direction. Uh, when it comes to the military dimension, uh, it seems that some of the issues that we might re realistically want from Russia uh, is to stop engaging in the dangerous brinkmanship uh, activities, uh, especially using its air forces and uh, its navy, uh, decrease the number of exercises in NATO's uh, vicinity, uh, possibly change the scenarios to less uh, assertive slash threatening. Uh, thirdly, uh, provide advanced information on exercises, including those uh, below the Vienna uh, document uh, threshold. Also to uh, stop exploiting loopholes uh, in the arms control and uh, confidence building measures, including the, the Russian practice of dividing the bigger exercises into smaller chunks. And uh, the last one, uh, to tone down uh, the information warfare against NATO and our partners. Let me stop here. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Lucas, for this uh, very uh, thorough and uh, I think uh, interesting way of looking at the exercises, both in a way not only as a form of practice, of course, for the ones participating, but also, as you point out, the, the signal value of each exercise, and that we really need to think about that uh, in an era where the threat of accidents is not then uh, negligible, as you say, uh, and also where we are struggling with uh, how to to uh, deter without provoke, as we discussed yesterday as well. So I think that, that uh, makes a, a very good uh, foundation for that kind of discussion. And then also, I think, I hope we can pick up on a range of the, the more practical uh, suggestions that, that comes from your uh, research, uh, as you said, on, on military communication, uh, assertiveness, formal agreements, uh, high visibility exercises, uh, prior to 2018 or, and, uh, and so on. So uh, please make note of that and I think we will uh, continue in, in the same line of, of, um, of thought here with uh, our next uh, panelist who is Anna Maria Diner, uh, a senior analyst at the Polish Institute of International Affairs. She deals with the hard security issues in the post-Soviet region, including military reform and the modernization of Russia's military industrial complex. And uh, Mrs. Diner has uh, published extensively on, on analysis concerning Russia, but also on Belarus. So Anna, how do you look at the development of the military presence here in the Baltic Sea region and the exercise pattern that has evolved during these years? Thank you, Anna, for so uh, kind words. Thank you, organizers, and uh, for uh, inviting me here for this excellent uh, conference. And as uh, Lukas mentioned, we used to work before, and he was my first boss who employed me to the PISM, so if something is wrong, it's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I feel a little bit confused because Lukas almost told everything, uh, but I try uh, at least uh, somehow to add something uh, to, to my speech. Um, the more that it's very difficult 
difficult to me to speak, to, to speak about military issues uh, in the front of uh, plenty of distinguished uh, military men here. But um, short look, what Russians uh, have in the Baltic uh, Baltic region? I mean, the uh, main and major component of uh, their military. Um, presence is of course uh, the Baltic Sea, uh, sea Fleet. Um, nowadays it's about approximately uh, 60 warships uh, plus a landing group in Kaliningrad. Um, the Baltic Sea Fleet consists about uh, 35,000 of soldiers and sailors and uh, it includes 13,000 of coastal defense troops. And it means that Russia as such um, has a conventional superiority in the Baltic Sea uh, region. Um, as Lukas mentioned, uh, during last year, Russia sig significantly increased its military presence, not only uh, in Black Sea region, which is very obvious uh, because of the situation in Ukraine, but also here in our region, I mean in the Baltic, uh, Baltic Sea region. Uh, in recent months, of course, so we could observe plenty of um, uh, Russian fighters flights, fighters of various types of on the destinations, uh, who fly very close uh, to the airspace border of NATO countries as well as Finland and Sweden or even violate uh, it. Moreover, Russians also used uh, uh, 295 uh, strategic bombers in the escort of uh, fighters uh, and it's all, we also could uh, say that uh, those accidents were um, very dangerous. Moreover, as uh, Lukas mentioned, uh, we have also plenty of accidents between uh, Russian military aircraft and civilian uh, aircraft. And uh, for us, I mean also for military experts, it's for, for Russians maybe it's not a kind of stupidity, but uh, flying uh, without uh, transporters uh, switch on, uh, it's asking for a next uh, next accidents, and I'm really um, I really don't don't know why Russians even ask for next uh, MH17 accident because it could be even uh, even like that. But I also was as as Anna told, I also was asked by the organizers to to say a little bit about exercises that took place last during last year uh, in the Baltic Sea region. Um, and first of all, um, in June last year, uh, it's very important to know that for the response of NATO's cyber strike 2014 and Baltops uh, 2014, um, Russian also um, started um, maneuvers in the Baltic, Baltic Sea. And uh, in these exercises, uh, airborne troops, um, aircraft, and 24 um, ships from Baltic uh, Sea Fleet were engaged. Uh, and the scenario of uh, this, uh, this exercises included uh, protection of the border and maritra maritime uh, transport craft, as well as uh, organi uh, organization of air defense and um, detection of enemy submarines. Uh, moreover, um, as uh, open um, sources uh, um, say that during those exercises uh, Iskander tactical missile systems probably were used and um, I remember one uh, interview with uh, the, pres the Russian president Vladimir Putin it was uh, in as far as I remember November 2013 uh, when uh, Putin answering on um, question of uh, Russian journalist about uh, Iskanders in Kaliningrad Oblast said that uh, they are uh, not there yet. So it means that Russia is ready to deploy there in every moment uh, they want to have. And speaking about Iskanders, there are also two um, very uh, crucial uh, momentum because we also have to observe uh, the. Um, we also have to observe the. Um, Russians uh, who want to deploy, uh, for instance, uh, Su-34 bombers because uh, they are also very uh, dangerous for uh, neighbors, especially th because they were projected to destroy um, infrastructure, infrastructure of, uh, of the enemy. Uh, and also we have to observe uh, the behaving on Russian in Belarusian territory, which is also very important for um, the Baltic Sea uh, region. The more that uh, 
Russia and Belarus uh, not only ha uh, have a common missile defense system, but also um, aircrafts, Russian aircrafts uh, patrol are currently patrolling uh, airspace of Belarus, and Russians want to deploy um, Su-27 SM-3 fighters on Belarusian territory, which also may uh, influence the, the situation uh, in, uh, in our region. Um, but coming back to, um, to the exercise, um, the next one, uh, next huge exercises took place in September 2014, also in Kaliningrad region. Uh, and also it was uh, um, large scale exercises of uh, Baltic Sea. Um, during these uh, maneuvers uh, were not only um, used um, ships, and other units, but also bombers Su-24 and um, battle helicopters uh, Mi-24. And uh, the main uh, plan of this uh, scenario included uh, landing on the coast uh, and occupying the enemy, the enemy settlements, which uh, is uh, projected for the Baltic, uh, Baltic Sea region. Uh, the next one, um, I mean, during, during last year, was in March 2015, so just um, three months ago. Um, and um, during this, uh, these exercises, ships of the Baltic uh, Sea Fleet uh, merged into several tactical groups, uh, and the main task was to, to practice air defense, um, mine maintenance, uh, and rocket and uh, artillery fire on the different uh, types of, uh, of targets. And uh, during this, uh, these exercises also, um, diesel electronic submarines were used, as well as missile boats, minesweepers, uh, small missiles and anti-submarine uh, ships, and corvettes. So uh, also op almost all kinds of ships which uh, Baltic Sea uh, uh, has on, uh, on its own. Um, and during... Um, during these exercises, there were also some exercises within the Western Military District and um, plenty of equipment, 3,000 of soldiers, um, aircraft, helicopters, ships were, were used uh, during, uh, during it. And uh, the official information from Russian side is that nothing special is going on in the region. There are our regular exercises. Uh, we want to check uh, our readiness. Um, uh, we want to be. Uh, uh, we want. It's a part of the um, Sir Dukov's reform, which was inaugurated in to, uh, in 2009. But definitely, it's not like that. That uh, is just for internal. Um, it's just an uh, internal issue of uh, Russian uh, Russian Federation. Um, so. Um, we also um, have to add that Russia reacts for NATO exercises not only in the region, I mean uh, Baltic uh, Sea Fleet uh, exercises uh, as an announcement, for instance, for Baltops, but um, for instance, um, Nowadays, we had these exercises in Scandinavia, and the response of Russia was to um, start uh, combat readiness checking in the central military district, which is very close to, to, to Ukraine, for instance. And what Russia want to achieve by uh, having such, uh, such operations? Um, first of all, to definitely is to test their equipment, pilots, uh, operation, operational capabilities, uh, and moreover show their own public opinion um, that the army is efficient and strong. It is also very important uh, for them, especially that uh, uh, if we consider that army wasn't perceived as, uh, as uh, strong and efficient before uh, 2009 and uh, Chechen's operation, Chechen's war first and second and Georgian war also showed that something uh, was on it. Um, moreover, Russia wants to test and respond the systems of NATO countries. I mean, uh, see the response time, verify which units are involved uh, in such uh, such activities. And for instance, in the Baltic Sea, uh, sorry, in the Black Sea region, it was also like um, ending the, capaci the, the capabilities of uh, Bulgarian aircrafts, uh, as far as I remember, because uh, uh, they have only two fighters with the ending of the resource, and then it occurred that some other NATO countries have to help them, uh, because there were so many times that, uh, that they, they, they have to um, 
ask for, 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 for help. And um, definitely Russia also, by having these exercises uh, and presenting its strength, uh, will use uh, all the weaknesses of uh, NATO countries. I mean from the beginning with the time-consuming co pro procedures of decision-taking in accordance with democratic procedures. For Russia, it's one minute to take a decision, just Vladimir Putin, and here we have uh, our partners and have to, have to discuss, uh, discuss it. Um, definitely, Russia also will um, want to present that it is able to quick response for all military uh, exercises that NATO leads uh, in the uh, Eastern members. And um, um, definitely, um, I'm pretty sure that after Baltops exercises this year, Russia will also respond for that, organizing something on uh, its Western or Central uh, military district. So uh, ending um, with recommendation, I totally agree with uh, that that Lukas, Lukas said that we as a NATO states and our um, friends like Sweden and Finland um, definitely has to show their solidarity and uh, has also to present the readiness, um, the combat readiness uh, in, the, in the region. Uh, the more that as far as I mentioned, Russia will try to use all weaknesses of uh, NATO uh, countries here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Anna, for um, giving us this uh, thorough picture of, of what's going on uh, from the Russian side in the region and, uh, and also for the recommendations there on, on continue to, to show solidarity and, and um, also have our own readiness uh, well at hand. Uh, and that will lead us into the final panelist here who will uh, uh, give us more of a uh, NATO Western perspective. It's uh, Richard Froh, who is former Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Operations at NATO. And uh, Mr. Froh held responsibilities in this position for the Alliance operations in Afghanistan, in Libya, the Balkans, as well as uh, counter piracy and various training missions. And uh, he has also worked ex intensively with increased NATO uh, partner interoperability and uh, also reformed NATO's procurement and research and logistics uh, agencies. So uh, we are very happy to have you with us and uh, uh, Rick if we look at the West NATO and partners um, we have worked out of area operations for almost 20 years and now we are kind of coming back to territorial defense uh, and those issues. It's kind of a, a drastic uh, shift. And what uh, implications does this have for, for military exercises and training and, and how we should, should think ahead? Please. Okay. Well, let me answer your question quickly and then I'll go into the presentation. I mean, the, the implications are training is training. You, you set your goals uh, perhaps differently. Uh, but in the end, a well-trained military force that's able to do the whole range of activities uh, should be able to adapt to uh, the challenges of today. Good leadership, well supported with political backing and with good capabilities uh, should be able to handle the, the job. A lot of cases we're going back. There's a, a number of us we're Cold War warriors, uh, so we're bringing that back. But there's a whole new generation of uh, young officers who are coming through, officers and uh, non-commissioned officers who are leading our forces. Let me just uh, start, as I think all the panelists have done, by uh, thanking the Swedish Institute for International Affairs for organizing uh, this very timely conference, and the Swedish Armed Forces and uh, U.S. European Command for hosting. Uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, the hosts and the organizers for choosing uh, Gotland uh, as an inspired uh, choice for this conference. Uh, strategic location, but I think also historical. And we've had the last couple of nights opportunity to learn a little bit about the history of, of Visby. Uh, broader than that, and when I'd, I'd never been to Gotland, I'd never, uh, certainly never been to Visby, so I did a little bit of research and found out about the Hanseatic League. And uh, very interesting, sort of a precursor of uh, the European Union and NATO. Uh, they didn't have problems of coordination, they did it all together. And it was a case of security is needed to enable trade and economies to grow. Uh, and that's probably exactly where we are today. Uh, the Hanseatic League went from London 
uh, right into what's now Russia and Novo Gorodo, uh, including Bruges and, and Visby. It had a, a common defense uh, thread to it. One of their requirements when they joined was common protection and defense against enemies, uh, which was necessary to provide the security for allow them to do their trade. But let me then fast forward to today. Now, we've heard about uh, the increased activity in the Baltic Sea. Uh, our questions on this panel are, you know, what are the challenges? What are the patterns? What can we expect in the future? What are the implications? And I think that's implications for nations as well as international organizations like NATO and the EU. And is there a need for new approaches or new guidelines? I think you're probably all aware of the, the NATO uh, Readiness Action Plan that was uh, launched, approved at the Wales Summit last September. But let me just briefly uh, try and hit the high points and bring us all up to the same level. Uh, remember, the RAP is focused on two areas, both the uh, increased military activities uh, from Russia, uh, but also the risks and the threats that come from the south. And we have to be able to do both. It's not an either or. Uh, there's a requirement to strengthen our collective defense, uh, but as well our crisis management capabilities. There are two parts. The assurance measures, which are immediate reinforcement to the east, uh, and adopt adaptation measures, which are longer term, to change the NATO force pattern, to increase our readiness and our ability to address security challenges anywhere, both the east and the south, or anywhere else they come from. The assurance measures are land, sea, and air activities uh, that were aimed to re reinforce, reassure, and deter. Uh, Baltic air policing, we've had for quite some time, but it was a little under-resourced. Now it's fully resourced. Nations are committed to that, bringing the uh, necessary aircraft in. Uh, we've also deployed fighters to Poland and Romania from other NATO nations. Uh, regular AWACS flights. So surveillance, uh, our eye in the sky, uh, as well as maritime patrol aircraft, particularly along our eastern borders. We've intensified maritime patrols in the Baltic, Black, and Mediterranean seas using our standing naval groups and our standing maritime groups and our standing mine countermine groups. And we've deployed ground troops uh, to those areas. Exercises, just uh, if you go on the NATO website, uh, there's a link to the exercise program, eight pages of exercises. Uh, in May alone, there are 10 exercises, I count, uh, in the Baltic region, uh, and in June, 11. Uh, from very large to much smaller exercises, but all very focused. Uh, in, in the good old Cold War days, that's exactly what we did. We exercised, we prepared, we had uh, general defense plans and we exercise those plans. We work together cooperatively, uh, various national forces working together, Army, Navy, and Air Force. Second area was adaptation measures. Uh, there's a number of items to that. First was to improve our NATO response force. It's been there. Uh, we've never used it. It's been difficult to generate the forces. It's been a capability. It was always meant as a way to improve interoperability. Uh, among our forces. Uh, we've actually been doing operations that have been a much better way of uh, doing interoperability. But the NRF is now coming back into its own. We're looking at doubling the size to 13,000. Uh, we have the Very High Readiness Joint uh, Task Force, which has also been called our spearhead force. About 5,000 people, uh, 5,000 troops to be able to d deploy in 48 hours. It includes uh, largely land forces, but supported by air and maritime. Uh, the full force will be stood up in 2016, but there's an interim capability uh, in place now. We have multinational NATO command and control posts in all the Eastern Allies, the three Baltic nations, Poland, Romania, and Bulgaria. We have created NATO force integration units to prepare and support exercises and deployments. We've raised the readiness and capabilities of the multinational core northeast. We've planning to, we have pre-positioned and planning to pre-position more military supplies. Uh, logistics is, any military man knows logistics is the key to any operation. So if you can get your supplies that you're going to need, your equipment you're going to need in place, you don't have to move it there, it means you can react faster and you can sustain yourself longer. We have also uh, prepared national infrastructures for reinforcement. In the good old Cold War days, we had 
good arrangements for moving, uh, rail moves, sea moves, reinforcements from North America. We haven't done that for a long time. On the other hand, we have deployed to uh, uh, theaters almost around the world. So we're drawing on that experience, but it is a little bit different. Uh, and we're looking to update our defense plans. You know, planning is essential. The plans are useless, but planning is essential. The challenges today, of course, are, are Russian snap exercises, Russian uh, increased air and maritime probing uh, to test our defenses, uh, the use of media uh, to counter both to media into the Russian population, but also against our population, and then that neutral group uh, who is neither North American, European, or uh, uh, Russian. So the rest of the world what do they think about it and who are they going to support? Uh, the media impact and what, uh, how our story is getting across, the importance of, of countering uh, the Russian uh, story, information warfare. Uh, a lot of cases, I think some of the Russian actions and again some of our reactions were taking pages from the old Cold War playbook. Expectations in the future, I think, probably more of the same. I don't see it changing in the, uh, the near term. Uh, Russia's attempting to, uh, particularly after the Ukraine, uh, Crimea and now the eastern Ukraine, I think they'd like to return to normal. Uh, they'd like what happened after the Georgia crisis. We were very upset, but very quickly we seem to have gotten over it. Uh, I think they would like to return to that normal, and that becomes the new norm, and then they'll look at what they can do next. Uh, and I just give you a couple of minor, uh, or a minor example of that, uh, Eurovision Song Contest. And let me <laughs> congratulate Sweden for winning. Uh, last year, you know, just after the, the Crimean crisis, uh, the, the Russian performer was booed. Uh, Russia got virtually nothing. This year, very, very smart, very good talent, lovely young lady, pretty, was very, very close to winning it. So the world has changed, and in some cases we're, we're looking at how we move on to that. The other is that I think Russians see many actions in terms of an attack by the West. And the very current one, of course, is, uh, is FIFA. Uh, they see the American uh, actions, what the U.S. courts are doing uh, to the, the FIFA executive, and as of this morning, Seth Blatter, uh, as an attack on Russia and the Russian uh, World Cup. 2018, okay, and that will play through. So I think that's something to watch. Um, now, this panel is on military, uh, and, and none of us are military. I used to be military. Uh, but military is part of the solution. It's an essential part of the solution, but it's not the only part of the solution. We need a broader uh, response, particularly to hybrid warfare. Uh, and hybrid threats. The police need to be involved because there's a lot of criminal organized crime. Uh, the Justice Department, customs, immigration, economic, uh, the media, uh, cyber, and our ability to defend against cyber attacks, Coast Guards. Uh, we need all parts of national governments to work together. Uh, and then we need to do the same thing at the multinational and the regional le level. Uh, NATO, EU have to work better together. Nations within a region, I think, to have to do a better job of sharing information and uh, being ready for what happens. We shouldn't be, in the old military term, uh, Mr. Putin has uh, internal lines of communication, very fast decision making. He has everything he needs. The rest of us ha are external and we have to coordinate among ourselves. And I think that will be key and that's what we need to do uh, to be able to win. We need to draw on our common interests. Uh, and again, going back to historic times, the Hanseatic League. And they were very different people, but they had a common thread. Uh, we have probably much more in common, and we need to build on that. Uh, it's already been talked about the need for confidence and security building measures. Uh, the, the old CDE uh, from the Stockholm uh, Conference in 1984, uh, very effective. Uh, when I was commanding an engineer regiment in Germany, Canadian engineer regiment, I was inspected by a CDE inspection. Uh, you know, the, the, the Czechoslovakian uh, major general came through. Uh, the Russian, uh, or sorry, Soviet officer uh, had his camera, took pictures. You know, I, I, I knew he was a spy. I was also trying to get information from him. Uh, 
So I think that sort of transparency we need to do. Uh, if you remember, there were six key measures to that, the exchange of information on the location and uh, organization of military uh, or forces, uh, an annual forecast of military exercises based on certain thresholds, a 45-day uh, uh, need to notify military exercises at a lower level, uh, invitation for observers, uh, on-site inspections that couldn't be refused, and improve communications. So I think a number of those are there. Our communication, uh, we have the uh, Chairman of the Military Committee and SACUR have uh, open lines. We've heard they've been confirmed to the uh, Russian Chief of Defense Staff. Last night at dinner, uh, I learned the uh, Norwegian uh, commander of the Northern Command has weekly, regular, scheduled weekly conversations with the commander of the Russian Nor Northern Fleet. I think that's what we have to do. Uh, military to military, put the politics aside, uh, and you might even be potential enemies at some point, but you do need to be able to talk to avoid those misunderstandings and things that could escalate. Uh, our Secretary General met with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov on the 19th of May. He handed over our exercise plan, NATO exercise plan, for the rest of 2015. And he, of course, asked for something similar from the Russian side. It has not come yet. Uh, our side, as I said, is available on the NATO website if you want to see, and hopefully that, that the shape people will keep that up to date. Um, we're in dangerous times. I think we have, uh, have to draw the lessons that we learned from the Cold War. Uh, we need to not provoke, but on the other hand, we don't have to bend and bend and bend. I don't think the Russians uh, respect people that always give in, uh, but on the other hand, be careful, pick your fights. We don't need to make uh, Russia happy, try to make Russia happy. Russia, no matter what we do, probably won't be happy. Uh, but we have to have our military prepared, uh, and we have to then enter into dialogue with them from a position of strength. What can we do, and like my fellow panelists, uh, offer some suggestions. Situation awareness is key. Information sharing uh, among, uh, within a government, but then between governments will be important, and then between international organizations. We need to coordinate our exercises. There's an awful lot being done nationally and bilaterally and multilaterally uh, within NATO, outside NATO, in the European Union. We have to make sure we're all aware of that. Uh, you know, before, I don't think we were not coordinating because we didn't want to. I think it was just we were all too busy. Well, now it's important that we are coordinating because an action in one area can have an effect on the other. Uh, and particularly from a NATO point of view, we have to work very closely with our partners in the Baltic region who are, are not allies, uh, Finland and Sweden. And last but not least, I think we have to do a better job of looking at the hybrid threats and what we can do and should do first nationally, but then more broadly, to counter those threats. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that uh, expose, very interesting uh, suggestions also that fit and I think, well, what, what we have heard before, it's recurrent here, I think, how we need to connect and, and develop cooperation and coordination also with the police, uh, Justice Department, Customs, uh, uh, Coast Guards. And, and uh, that is new, not a new issue, but perhaps the urgency of actually moving forward with those kind of uh, scenarios and not leaving also the military aspect out of it, but uh, merging these two together in a new setting and, and looking at the challenge ahead could be a really important task ahead. I also think you made a very good point there on the media impact and, and uh, also how it comes on, on communicating around issues such as joint exercises. Do we have a, a good communication, uh, the countries that participate on this? We had in Sweden a very big debate around uh, the, the two exercises that are going, going on now, the flying exercise up north and Baltops coming up. And, and to some extent, it feels as if uh, all sides are not really working on, on why we are doing this and why it is important. And perhaps we could, could do more uh, together on, on also communications around 
uh, how we view this together because we're all in, in these uh, exercises together. So I think th those are really important uh, aspects and I'm sure uh, there are lots of, of thoughts on how, how to move, move this forward. Also the involvement of partners, I think, in, if we talk about uh, communication, milita increased military communication, for instance, with the Russians, how do uh, countries that are not part of NATO come into that um, system? Uh, or should we do, do separate things on that? Um, and also the formal agreements that perhaps uh, will they, are there, is there a new uh, need for new formal agreements uh, to deal with this or can we shake off old uh, formal agreements, look at what we had from the Cold War and, and try to activate those. 